Hi, I'm Anna, and on this week's Saturday Adventure, I'm taking you to the strangest place I know. My hometown! Welcome to Binghamton, New York. You've probably heard of it. Everywhere I go, all over the world, I find a connection to Binghamton almost right away. This was the birthplace of IBM. This was the birthplace of the flight simulator. It is a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. What you might not know about Binghamton, it's the real Twilight Zone. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. While that could be an accurate description of most TV news shows these days, in the 1970s, only In Search Of was brave enough to declare it up front. Leonard Nimoy was my first guide into the world of cryptozoology and the paranormal in reruns at 10 a.m. every day when I stayed home sick from school. I lived in Broome County, the self-proclaimed carousel capital of the world. George F. Johnson was an owner of the Endicott Johnson Shoe Manufacturing Company, and his novel strategy for company loyalty was affordable housing, unmatched wages, and public projects like parks and recreation centers, not only for his employees, but the whole community. The Carousel Capital nickname comes from the six carousels Johnson donated in the early 1900s, with the caveat that they must always remain free to everyone forever. Out of the roughly 150 antique carousels remaining in operation across North America, six are in Broome County. Johnson is still a beloved figure in Binghamton a hundred years later, and a fun local tradition is to ride all of the carousels in one summer to earn a commemorative carousel circuit button. One year, I rode all of them in a single day. This pavilion in Recreation Park marks the spot where an ad agency vice president named Martin Sloan came to visit when his car needed service near the town where he grew up. Martin notices a boy carving his name in the same bandstand he carved his name in as a child. If you live here, you call it Rec Park. That night, Martin confronted the same boy and chased him through a busy merry-go-round until the boy fell and injured his leg, the same injury that still plagued Martin as an adult. He should have known it's not unusual to be the victim of a time loop in the fifth dimension. Martin Sloan was a character on a television show, and his merry-go-round had been torn down years ago. The carousel it was based on had continued to operate every day of every summer since a little boy named Rodman Serling would walk there from his house on the west side. Serling became famous for his scripts, Planet of the Apes, and Requiem for a Heavyweight. But his real mark was made when the monsters were due on Maple Street, or by the fearsome gremlin that taunted William Shatner from the wing of an airplane. The little street in Binghamton where Serling grew up still looks a lot like Maple Street. Sadly, while the carousel does remain, the Serling Memorial Pavilion was recently closed after years of poor upkeep left it in a shabby condition. The future of the pavilion is uncertain. Of all of the famous and important people to be connected to the area, Rod Serling is the most celebrated, and it's not hard to see why. There is still strange magic in Binghamton, and Rod Serling picked up on it. Rotting husks of Masonic temples are sprinkled liberally, 
and you don't have to look hard to find esoteric symbols such as the green man, Egyptian pharaohs, or even Hermes Trace Majestus peering out from a building facade. For many years, we had a cowboy named Elvis wandering the streets. He called everyone Linda Blair. He used to call me Tinkerbell. Legends tell of curses on settlements at the confluence of two rivers, and the aptly named Confluence Park is right at the center of the city where the Susquehanna and Shenango rivers meet. This is a city of ghosts. Spring Forest Cemetery is a hidden glade in the center of the city. Cloaked in trees, up on a hill, rest the victims of the 1913 Binghamton Clothing Factory Fire. 31 employees burned to death when the overcrowded factory went up in flames. 21 bodies were burned so badly they could not be identified. They were buried together around a giant stone that marks their passing. A more notorious name is etched not far away. Ogarita Booth Henderson claimed to be the daughter of America's first presidential assassin, hoping to tie herself to his famous thespian family. Based on Booth's known performances at the time, Rita Booth's paternal claim is quite dubious. Nonetheless, Ogarita had been on stage for the better part of 15 years when her theatrical troupe passed through Binghamton. Rita Booth dropped dead from pneumonia at the age of 32 in the middle of her performance and was interred in Glenwood Cemetery overlooking the Valley of Opportunity. Binghamton's second most famous local boy done good resides eternally across the valley. Meet Exterminator, winner of 50 first place finishes and the father of Secretariat. That's right, you know Secretariat. Exterminator was owned by Willis Sharp Kilmer. Kilmer made his fortune by stealing the fortune of his uncle, the very famous founder of Dr. Kilmer's Swamp Root. Even though the Kilmers were quacks and charlatans that were so greedy they preyed upon their own family, they are still well regarded in Binghamton and the triangle-shaped Kilmer building remains an anchor downtown. It's not all graves. Occasionally you can find a dinosaur. Wizard of Id creator Johnny Hart lived just over the hill from me, and his Brontosaurus was a star around town when I was growing up. I went to his funeral when he died and... Oh, damn it, I did it again. One of those Brontosaurus still stands at the Ross Park Zoo. A fun side note, a kangaroo was purchased from the zoo in 1909 to be used as a Jersey Devil sideshow host. Strange things happen in Binghamton. Looming over the city are the remains of the New York State Inebria Asylum, which opened in 1864 to treat alcoholism. It was turned into a mental asylum in 1879 and continues to be the source of many urban legends. A number of facilities on the campus remain in use, but the original Castle on the Hill has been vacant since 1993. Even though Rod Serling was a major name in media, his heart was always in upstate. His later years were spent near Ithaca on the banks of Cayuga Lake. By then, Serling was smoking three to four packs of cigarettes a day. A series of three heart attacks in a two-day period left Serling dead in the middle of open-heart surgery on June 28, 1975. He was 50 years old. He had recently completed narration on three feature-length paranormal documentaries. After Serling's death, the series was adapted for television as In Search Of with Leonard Niboy, as I discovered it two decades later. Rod Serling's final resting place is in the little town of Interlaken, on the side of a hill, 
looking east over Cayuga Lake. His little stone is encircled with tributes and mementos left by devotees. I sat with him a few minutes and listened to the whispers on the wind before I headed back to the Twilight Zone.